Thank you, Pastor David. Praise the Lord. I love you guys. So good to see you. Every time I come back, I do feel like it's, you know, home. Uh, we're family. And if I haven't had the opportunity to meet some of you, or oh, shake your hand. Please come speak to me. But I love you guys. It's so wonderful to see you. Thanks for coming out on Saturday night, man. I'll tell you, we're going to have a good time. Anybody ready? Anytime you come together uh, as a family of God and with the Word of God, uh, you're going to be blessed. Amen. And so, uh, you know, we've been here, as he said, many, many, many years. So, And you're so well taught here. I'm sure there's nothing I'm going to share with you tonight you've never heard. But, hey, it's always good to rehearse, right, and hear it again. Glory to God. So my prayer tonight is that you, all of us, all of us will uh, go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Amen. So 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, the Apostle Paul writing, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, he said, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all those that love his appearing. How many of you are looking for his soon coming? Amen. Praise the Lord. But we're going to occupy till he comes. Glory. But this is such a powerful uh, statement by the Apostle Paul uh, to know, you know, that he'd come to the culmination uh, and the end of his earthly life, and that he had fought well. He'd faced the challenges and adversities uh, of life and ministry as a pioneer of the gospel, and yet he finished what God called him to do. Amen? That's a great testimony. There's another one in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Y'all have to forgive me. This dry air up here. I got some. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds, one translation says, or become discouraged in your souls. Uh, so this scripture talks about perseverance. It talks about patience and determination. And so, you know, each of us, we have a course to run, right? A race to run, a course to finish, a divine purpose to fulfill. And I believe it would be God's divine intention for every one of us to finish and to finish well, just like the Apostle Paul, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, not just finish, not just drag across the finish line, but finish with joy. Everybody say joy. You know, all of us, and I don't care who you are, all of us can face the temptation in life at times to grow weary with the journey, to lose sight of the goal, uh, maybe to get a little uh, frustrated when things haven't gone perhaps in the direction that maybe we were anticipating, or perhaps they haven't progressed as rapidly as, as we thought they would. You and I realize, you know, there's resistance in life, right? I mean, there's difficult people to deal with, right? There's physical, financial, relational, spiritual, emotional challenges uh, that all of us face. The Apostle Paul faced all of these, and yet, man, his perspective in life and his response to life and to the people and the challenges uh, that he encountered was amazingly uh, positive. 
Paul had what we call the predisposition of a victor. Are you with me? Uh, and so uh, he writes about one of these particular uh, situations that he encountered. And, and of course, you and I have looked at it. You've read it many times. We've heard it. We've, uh, you know, discussed it. But it's still a great thing to look at. One of these potentially overwhelming moments, 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 9. Notice what the Apostle Paul said. He said, guys, we're troubled on every side. How many of you ever, ever noticed that trouble seems to come with company, friends? Not just one thing, but several things seemingly tend to converge simultaneously on multiple fronts. I kind of call it the devil's pile-up technique, trying to, you know, overwhelm us, get us discouraged. And Paul was obviously having one of these moments. He said, we are troubled on every side, but I want you to notice his response. I want you to notice his mentality, what we call the spirit of faith. He said, yet not, what? Distressed. Not distressed. He said, look, I'm not going to allow these temporary external frustrations and challenges and oppositions of the moment to rob me of my internal sense of peace and confidence and faith in God. Troubled on every side, yet not distressed. And then he went on to say this word, which to me is very interesting. He said perplexed. Do you know what it means to be perplexed? It means to be puzzled, actually. And I think, uh, you know, Paul was basically saying, you know, life at times can be a little perplexing, a little puzzling. And what he meant by that is, look, I don't have all the answers. I can't always tell you why this happened, that happened, why we're uh, you know, facing this situation, or why this person behaved the way they did or responded this way. Look, he said, I don't have all the answers. But just because I can't wrap my head around it all, and maybe I'm seeing through a glass dimly at this moment, and my perspective is somewhat limited, and I might have some questions, doesn't mean I'm going to throw in the towel, sit down, and quit, and adopt this attitude of futility. Why should I even try? He said, no, life can be a little perplexing and puzzling at times. What's the next word? But not in despair. I'm not going to allow all the unanswered questions to cause me to shipwreck my faith. Are you with me? Then he goes on to say, persecuted, and all of us are going to face persecution uh, at times, I'm sure. The Bible says all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Next, next word, but not forsaken. Then he says, cast down, but not destroyed. One translation says, uh, struck down, but not struck out. I think some Christians need a but revelation. And I'm not talking about the part we're sitting on tonight. I'm talking about the conjunction but. The psalmist said in Psalm 30 and verse 5, uh, you know, he said, weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Then he said in, in, in Psalm 34 and 19, isn't it? He said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver them out of them all. Woo! <laughs> and then, of course, Jesus himself said in John 16 and 33, he said, look, in this world, this crazy degenerative world, you're going to have some stuff to deal with, right? But be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world, and I've likewise made you an overcomer. Turn to your neighbor and say, you need a butt revelation. Woo! <laughs> you know, when the Apostle Paul uh, penned the words to uh, the, the letter to the people of Philippi, which we term the, the epistle of Philippians, uh, how many of you know when he wrote that 
particular epistle, that he wasn't seated in a, in a five-star hotel uh, with breakfast in bed, <laughs> right? I, I mean, at this point, he was, of course, in, in prison. Now, when he was imprisoned in Rome, he did have a period of time where he was in a rented home for about two and a half years, which was not so bad. He was allowed visitors and so forth. But in his early imprisonment, and some are not aware of this reality, he was really held in what we would call a dungeon cell initially. It was under the palace of Rome, just above the central holding area of all of the sewage of the city. So basically, basically here's Paul in a dungeon cell, very little light, uh, the stench uh, of sewage probably filling those corridors, and it was in and out of situations like this, that he penned the words that we term the epistle of joy, and particularly uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, you know the verse well. The Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, he said, in case you didn't hear me the first time, let me repeat myself. Again, I say, rejoice. One translation says, all joy be yours at all times. Another one says, always be glad in the Lord. Wow. That brings a little clarity, doesn't it, for you and I in this journey of life that we're living, realizing that our focus in life and our perspective uh, in life and our response to life and to the people that we encounter and the situations and challenges that we encounter can have tremendous impact on how we journey through this life and how we finish our race. I think sometimes we think that if our lives were perfect, that somehow we could be happy. But how many of you know life isn't perfect? Man, I was such a perfectionist. I've told you those stories. Uh, 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 you know, when I was single, I mean, man, I had all my ducks in a row. All the underwear were in the drawer perfectly. The socks, the t-shirts, all the hangers must match. Everything has to be perfect. I would vacuum and mop my garage. I, I, I mean, the, the grass, the hedges, it just has to be immaculate. That was my, I just was born that way. But once again, how many of you know life's not perfect? And it's not going to be perfect. And I had to learn that <laughs> so that I could be happy in life. <laughs> so the reality is, you know, our circumstances and our situations in and of themselves do not possess the power to dictate my internal or your internal sense of joy and peace. But my focus, my perspective, and my response do. Are you with me? So Philippians 4 and 4 again, Paul said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, that's a wonderful admonition. But how do I actualize that? How does that become a living reality? Aren't you glad the Bible tells us? One of the first things he said that you can do if you want to rejoice always, if you want to be glad in the Lord and live in joy and peace, is you're going to have to deal with the issue of care. Philippians 4, and I know you've been taught this multiple times, but I felt led in my heart to say it again. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul said, Be careful for nothing, but... In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that passes understanding will keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So Paul said, basically, listen, joy and peace is going to be most fully realized in the life of a Christian who has learned, and it is a learning process, who has learned to live their life free from care, which is weight. Now, he did not say free from responsibility. 
He did not say free from the necessary duties and activities of life. He did not say free from difficult people or challenging situations or adversities that may arise or difficult work environments. He said free from the care of them. Right? Now, I want to quote the New Living uh, Translation to you. I'll just quote it. We don't have it. We don't need it. But the Bible says here, uh, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. You know it. Listen, tell God your needs. And don't forget to thank Him for the answers. If you will do this, then God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand, will do what? Will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Woo! I didn't give you that scripture, so no worries about it. All right, so what do we see? Don't worry. Don't fret. Right? About anything. Now, Listen, when I say that, some people say, oh, the Lord's got it. Now listen, I'm not uh, suggesting or suggesting uh, passivity in life. Uh, being unattentive to things that we need to be attentive to. We have personal responsibilities. We do what we know to do. We apply the scriptures we know to apply. And when we've done all that we know to do according to the wisdom that God has given us and what he's written in his word, then he said, I need you to rest. And I need you to stop worrying. Right? The Amplified says, don't worry, don't fret, don't have anxiety about anything. Wow. <laughs> what? Anything, right? Well, anything means anything, right? So, you say, well, why? Why don't we fret? Don't we have anxiety about anything? Because, friends, those actions carry consequences. They're destructive, they open the door to fear, and then when fear enters, faith is displaced. Peace is displaced. Joy is displaced. Are you with me? So he said, don't fret. Now that word fret comes from the old English word fretten. And it actually has the connotation of a bird of prey or an animal of prey that eats its prey piece by piece. And isn't that exactly what worry does? It begins to eat away piece by piece at our sense of confidence and joy and faith. Are you with me? So basically, Paul uh, said, don't do that. Now, how many of us know that fear enters through the doorway of the mind? That's how fear, fear enters. Right? So what happens is Satan will come and he will attempt to paint on the canvas of our minds portraits of failure, defeat, the worst case scenario. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this doesn't happen? Are you, are you with me? With the intention of bringing fear, and once again, once the fear enters, then the peace is displaced, the joy is impacted, and the faith and confidence likewise is impacted. So, how many of you know, and we've talked about it many times, how many of you know what worry is? Worry is meditating in a negative direction. Now, as a Christian, we advocate meditation. Because meditation is where you take a small portion of Scripture and you rehearse it and you reflect upon it over and over. It's like having a cup and a tea bag, cup of hot water and a tea bag. Uh, you dip that tea bag one time into the hot water, very little of the flavor or the color of the tea will be absorbed. What do you have to do? You have to dip it over and over and then let it steep, right? So that's like you getting up in the morning and you saying Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I have all I need. The New Living Translation. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. And at lunch, you get it out and you say it again. Woo! The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. And at night before I go to bed, the Lord, Lord, you're my shepherd. Thank you. I have all that I need. Maybe it's a healing scripture. He bore my sicknesses. He carried my diseases. By the stripes that wounded him, I'm healed and made whole. You just keep dipping that tea bag over and over until all of the power resident within that living word of God is absorbed into your human spirit and manifests the very thing it carries. Are you with me? So that's meditation in a positive direction. But worry is implementing that same exercise in a negative direction. Constantly, as we said, reflecting upon the potential uncertainties of life. What if this happens? What if that doesn't happen? What if the money doesn't come? What if I don't get better? What if the kids don't turn around? What are you going to do? Now you're dipping your tea bag, right? But it's carrying the wrong substance. It's releasing fear. Are you with me? So Paul said, don't do that, right? Now, if we had to sum up his, his uh, teaching here in this book of Philippians 4 through 7, in a modern phrase, it would just be, don't worry, be happy. Be happy. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't worry. <laughs> be happy. Woo! Praise God. Now listen. What absolutely astounds me as a Christian is realizing that all of those words were written by a man whose life, I mean the cumulative experiences of Paul's life from a natural perspective were absolutely staggering. He was no stranger to adversity. You ever read his testimony? If you haven't, I want to read it to you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 28. Notice this is in the Message Bible, I think, yeah. He said, you know, I have worked harder. I have been jailed more often. I've been beaten up more times than I can count. I've been at death's door time after time. I've been flogged five times with the Jews, 39 lashes. Can you imagine that man's back? What his back must have looked like after 39 lashes five times? Woo! Man, beaten by Roman rods three times, pummeled with rocks once. Remember he was in Lystra and they stoned him, drug him out of the city and stoned him, and they thought he was dead, and all his disciples and friends got around him. I'm sure they were praying. It doesn't say there, but they said they gathered around him. Resurrection power came in. He was raised up, went right back into the city. Woo! I've been shipwrecked three times, immersed in an open sea for a night and a day. I've been in hard traveling year in, year out. I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by desert sun and sea storm. I've been betrayed by those that I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery, hard labor, many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal blasted by the cold, naked to the weather, and that's not the half of it. <laughs> when you throw in the daily pressures and anxieties of all the churches. And you and I think we've had a challenging month or year. I don't think any of us have experienced the totality of what this man experienced as persecution for the sake of the gospel. Are you with me? <laughs> but you got to love his attitude. Woo! Look, Acts 20 and 24. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy 
and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul said, hey, I have learned how to celebrate my Christian faith, how to walk in joy, walk in peace in the midst of of the most extraordinarily difficult and challenging situations. How did you do it, Paul? He said, well, first of all, I've already told you. I've learned to live my life free from the care of things. And in conjunction with that, I've also learned to think properly. Philippians 4 and verse 8, here's the, here's the uh, adjoining verse. Finally, brethren... Whatever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, somebody tell me what he said. Think on these things. Paul said, I've learned to think properly. Now, as a believer, we're not speaking about mere positive thinking. The world has adopted that ideology uh, from Scripture, really. But we're talking about, yes, positive thinking, but it's comprised of God's Word. It is Word-based thinking. It is God-centered thinking. Are you with me? So Paul said, I have learned to think properly. I've learned how to focus my attention properly because I realize that whatever I focus my attention upon, man, that is what is is going to have the greatest impact on my heart, my joy, my peace, my faith. Are you with me? Uh, how many of you know the devil wants your attention? Right? Absolutely. And he's always vying for it. Hey, look at it. Feel it. Think about it. What are you going to do? May I have your attention, please? And you got to put up the hand and say, Devil, talk to the hand. You may not have my attention because I know. <laughs> my attention is directly connected to my faith, my strength, my joy, my peace, and my confidence in God. Amen? Directly connected. So we can't have an undisciplined mind and walk in joy and peace. It's impossible. I've said it to you many times. An undisciplined mind's like an undisciplined child. Unruly, no boundaries, headed for trouble. Are you with me? So we got to pay attention to where we're putting our attention. Now sometimes people say, well, I can't control my thoughts. Oh, yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can control your thoughts. Now, it might take a little effort. Let's say I had a helmet, and I could put it on your head, right? Tonight, it was a special helmet. And while I'm preaching, every thought that you were thinking was projected up on that screen for everybody in the room to see. I wonder if you could control your thoughts. Oh! <laughs> I bet you could. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You'll be thinking everything good, right? We can do it. We just got to put forth a little effort. So Paul said, I've learned to do that. I've learned to focus my attention, to think properly. What do you think about Paul? He said, well, man, listen, in, instead of focusing all of my attention on the negativities, and we read them, they were plenty of them. Rather than focusing my attention on the potential uncertainties of life and the fears and the anxieties and frustrations potentially of the moment, I just start thinking about the fact that, uh, you know, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom and of what shall I be afraid? He said, I think about the fact he has made me more than a conqueror through him. That he always causes me to triumph in Christ Jesus. I think about the fact, man, and I'm fully persuaded that nothing 
neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth shall be able to separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. Now that's a mouthful. Because when you say nothing can separate me from the love of God, what is that love? It is a love that cares for you. It is a love that oversees and protects and defends and provides and supplies. Paul said nothing can separate me from that love. Woo! Glory to God. And I'll tell you another thing he thought about, and I think about it a lot. And my wife said, stop reading all the books about it. You're not going anywhere till Jesus comes. But he thought a lot about heaven, the hope of heaven, and his eternal reward. I get happy thinking about heaven. (laughs) I've read all these books about it. You know why? Because that's our home. I just kind of want to be informed. I like to know. When I go on a vacation, man, I scout it all out. I'm on the, you know, get your guide, all this. I want to know what's this, this, this. I like to be familiar. So when I get up there, even though I know it's going to blow my mind anyway, but I still kind of want to see, hey, wonder what we're going to expect. So I read a little bit about it, get excited. But Paul did. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 uh, through 18, didn't he write these words? He said, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will do what they're going to do. They're going to rise first. Now, I've told you this. You know, my mom and dad were cremated. So uh, they're up there on the mantle in my sister's house. Now, can you imagine her watching TV and all of a sudden the trumpet sounds and mom and dad pop out because the dead in Christ rise first? (laughs) And she's like, what? Get ready, honey, we're going. Woo! You know, we don't really know how long it'll be when the dead rise first because you remember the law of first mention there in Matthew when when the dead rose after Jesus arose and they appeared unto many in the city. So this is going to be something else. The dead in Christ shall rise first and we... (laughs) Live and remain, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Woo! And I love this part. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The crazier this world gets, the more comforting those words are. Woo! Glory to Jesus. So, Paul said, Let me tell you something, man. I am looking forward to that day. And he said, I really live my life with an eternal perspective. I realize that this life and any challenge, persecution, adversity, disappointment, sorrow that I may encounter in this life is in reality light and momentary in comparison to the eternal blessedness, if we want to call it that, that is awaiting us on the other side. Paul said, I'm going to run this race. Revelation 22, 12, notice what Jesus said. Behold, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according uh, to his word. Paul said, I'm living in expectation of that day. Anybody else? And he said, I'm going to run this race. I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to keep joy in my heart and a smile on my face because the day that I look upon him, I'm anticipating hearing him say, well done. You didn't just get over the finish line. Man, you ran over it. Ooh, with a smile, with joy, with some souls you won for the kingdom. Glory. Oh, hallelujah. So before we leave tonight, you know, it's been about five years, actually. I was looking back, you know, on some sermon titles and things. I think it's been about five years since we've got our joy cup full together. Now, y'all may have, but I hadn't got to drink with you. So I just thought we might as well have a good, good uh, drinking session. The new wine. 
Anybody with me? How many of you know Nehemiah 8 and 10? Says the joy of the Lord. It's in there somewhere, the very last sentence. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now guys, that's not just a Bible verse. It's a reality. There is a supernatural strength that comes from the fruit and the force of joy. It isn't a mere emotion for the Christian. Are you with me? And there's a strength that comes from it. Uh, joy is one of the characteristics of the kingdom. You can't walk around as a member of the kingdom with an old mully grub face. Something's wrong if that's the way you're walking around. Come on. Man, you're in the kingdom. You got life. Eternal life. Salvation. And the Bible says, Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, isn't it? That's what it says. It's not mere matters of, you know, the do's and the don'ts and the legalities, but it is righteousness. Man, we're in right standing with God through Jesus Christ. And when you have that, it produces peace and joy. So this is the characteristics of the kingdom that you and I are a part of, and we sure need to be reflecting it in this dark world. Don't walk around like the rest of people do that are in darkness with that old sad countenance and defeated outlook. Come on, man. We're in a different kingdom. Woo! We carry something. When you come into a room, you ought to light the place up. Not making a spectacle of, our, of ourselves, but there's something we carry. Let it emanate from your countenance. It's in there. Now, one, Psalm 126, you know it. Uh, when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the nations, the Lord's done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. glad. Amen. Now, I like that part. Our, our mouths, uh, what was it? Our tongues were filled with laughter. With singing in our mouth with laughter. Now, some people think that laughter should not be associated with Christianity or Christian services, that somehow it isn't reverent. But may, you know, listen, may, may I submit to you that God is the one who created laughter? Did he not? And it doesn't have to come as a result of a dirty joke. It can come out of pure joy. Amen. And did you know laughter is a manifestation of joy? Come on, think about it. When you laugh, we say God created laughter. When you laugh, you don't laugh from your head. <laughs> That's not where you laugh from. When you're really laughing, where do you laugh from? You laugh from your belly. From your belly. Out of your belly. That's where joy is. Don't you have a well of salvation? Isn't there joy in it? Now we understand the holiness of God. Those awesome times in awe of Him on our face. Yes, but He's multifaceted in His person just like we are because we're created in His image. And He likes to laugh. He does? Yeah, you ever read it? Psalm 2, Psalm 37. He who sits in the heavens laughs. At his enemies? <laughs> Ooh, you guys are cracking me up. You think you're going to take over. They think they're going to take over. <laughs> Bible says God, God enthroned merely laughs at them. <laughs> I like that. Oh, Lord have mercy. Their foolishness. Whew, I'm glad we're on the winning side. But anyway, so our mouths were filled with laughter. So 
You know, there's something very liberating about laughter. And did you know it also carries healing properties? I mean, doctors will tell you that when people laugh, there are certain endorphins that are released that actually bring healing and restoration uh, to the physiological body. Well, duh. God said it first. Proverbs 17 and 22. A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. So everybody say, ha, ha, ha. Now, contrary to popular opinion, Mark Hankins did not create the phrase, ha, ha, ha. Okay, I'm going to give you a little history. Now, back in the 1990s, I, I traveled with a man named Kenneth E. Hagen for 11 years. How many of you are familiar with his ministry? So back in the 1990s, the Lord instructed him to have what you call Holy Ghost meetings, simply where the Spirit was leading and in demonstration and so forth. Well, the body of Christ had been very filled with revelation knowledge and so forth, but it had become very dry in their faith. No joy, man, no celebration, no saturation. And so he said, I want you to have Holy Ghost meetings and let these people get saturated in my presence and let joy arise in the church. So, you know, for about seven of the 11 years I traveled with him, we had what we had called these Holy Ghost meetings. Well, man, they were, I mean, you could watch them on YouTube and stuff like that. I mean, they were wild, but they were God. It was God. I'm telling you, you can't fabricate that kind of stuff. Now, I can teach on it tonight. We can act upon it, which we will. But there was a real move of the Spirit along that way. Well, one night, and I'm telling you this story because of this ha-ha-ha. One night, uh, I mean, there was such an outpouring. People were laying out on the floor, laughing in the Spirit. I mean, people were dancing and so forth. Just a real outpouring, you know. And so we're on national television, and I'm the praise and worship leader. And so uh, at the end or conclusion of the service, Brother Hagen looks at me uh, and says, now we were on the floor at this time because we needed the, uh, the uh, pl platform for a lot of guests and so forth. So we happen to be down there, this particular meeting. And uh, he said to me, uh, Brother Marty, do you have a song that will fit in here? Into that? Now listen, he'd always told us as the praise and worship leaders and teams, if you sing the wrong song at the wrong time, it's going to kill the anointing. Or, you know, we say kill. I don't think you can kill the anointing. But you can certainly grieve the Spirit. Well, who wants to be responsible in front of 8,000 people on national television for killing the anointing? I didn't. So the bold man of faith and power that I am, I said to him, no, sir. <laughs> now, I'm the priest and worship leader, and I said, no, sir. <laughs> and he looked at me from the platform right over the microphone and he said, well, you will as soon as you get up here. <laughs> well, man, all the way up, thank God there's a lot of steps at that auditorium because all the way up I'm going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> On the inside, you know, give me the song. And y'all know it because I've sang it for you before. Uh, but, but, you know, these words started coming out of my belly. Ha, 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 he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Ha, 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 he, 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 hey. I resist you and you cannot stay. And man, it had verses. It was all by the Spirit. So the band came up, the singers came up. We all started singing it. And I don't know why it came out this way. But it came out like some kind of old tavern drinking song. And it kind of went like this. It was ha, 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 he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Singing ha, 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 he, 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 hey. I resist you and you can. Now y'all sing it with me. 
Oh, ah, ha, ha, he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Singing, ah, ha, ha, he, 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 hey. I resist you and you. Now sway a little bit. Sway a little bit. Oh, ah, ha, ha, he, 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 hey. Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Singing, ah, ha, ha, he, 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 hey. I resist you and you cannot stay. Now listen, God is my witness. 8,000 people started singing that. They were standing up, ha, 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 you know, singing it. And it just seemed like the more we sang it, the more saturated, I would say, the drunker we got. Because it just means saturated, you know. In the Spirit. How many of you know God never intended for any of us to go through this life sober? <laughs> He said, now don't get drunk with wine now, but be filled, be intoxicated if you wish, or saturated with the person and presence of the Holy Ghost. Woo! Amen. So, man, that place just got rocking. And you know, the more we went, the more saturated we became. So Ecclesiastes 3 and 4 says, there's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to dance. And guess what tonight is? A time to laugh. God, yeah, God wants you to get your joy tank full. Some of you have been running on empty. Right? And we need to get your joy tank full. There's something about full. Everybody say full. Staying filled with joy. Acts 13 and 52, you know the scripture. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Not just a little dab, filled. Here's another good one. John 15 and 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. Woo, full. Here's another good one. Now the God of hope. Aren't you glad he's not the God of hopelessness? <laughs> the God of hope. <clears throat> Fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So when we're believing, it's not, oh, I'm believing. I, oh yeah, I'm believing. No. Fill with all joy and peace in believing. I'm believing. <laughs> that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now notice fulfilled. When something is filled or full, what is it? It's saturated. There's no more room for anything else. Are you with me? And that's, man, when you get full, that means you're just full. You're saturated. Now you might be here tonight and you're just like an old dry sponge. <laughs> You ever seen an old dry sponge that's been up on the shelf all winter long? Man, that thing is hard. It's dry. You can throw it into a pail of water. You can throw it into a pail of water and it just sits on top. It's impervious to the water. It's so dry and hard. Well, what do you do? You get that thing and you push it under the water and you start working you might have to do that tonight. You might have to push yourself under the water. Prime your pump a little bit. You know how you prime your pump? You know those old hand pumps? You can prime your pump by ha, 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 ha. ha. It's in there. You just got to draw it up. I do that sometimes. <laughs> I just go ha, 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 ha. It doesn't take me long. But you can prime your pump. And man, you start drinking of the Spirit. That's what Ephesians 5.18 says. Be not, drunk with, <laughs> be not drunk with wine where it is in excess. But do what? Be filled with the Spirit. Now one translation says drink deeply of the Spirit. And one way you can drink is draw it up. Just ha ha ha. Now look. You may be, I hope I may, you may be here tonight 
And you've never seen what it looks like for somebody to get saturated with the Holy Ghost. Now, friends, I told you I was born and raised Southern Baptist. I'd never been in these types of atmospheres. But I'm telling you, when I got my first drink, whoo, I was hooked. You say, is that kind of sacrilegious the way? I'm drawing an analogy. When a person in the natural gets drunk or intoxicated, how did they do that? They drink until their blood is saturated with the substance of alcohol. How do you get filled with joy? Filled with the Holy Ghost? You drink until you are saturated with His joy and presence. Are you with me? What's that look like? Well, I'm going to show you what it looks like in a minute. There's a scripture, 1 Peter, is it uh, 1 and 8, where it says, talks about joy unspeakable, right? And full of glory. What does that mean, joy unspeakable? Sometimes, man, you just get so happy and so full of joy, you can't even put words to it. You, you might laugh it out. You might dance it out. You might shout it out. You might run it out. It's unspeakable. Now, I did all of those in this video. And I just want to kind of show you what it looks like when somebody gets saturated, all right? Now, as we're playing this video, I want you to open up your own spirit because the same anointing that was there is right here. And if you'll just prime your pump a little bit, you can start getting saturated right here tonight. You can go home with your joy cup full. Are you ready? Go ahead and play that video, mm. CJ. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Pause it. Pause it. Pause it. I'm so sorry. Because let me tell you this. Brother Hagen had said to me right before this one, he said, hey, you, you got a song you can sing? And man, I was so, I'd already been drinking all that surface of the Spirit. And I was so saturated, I could not get the words out. So that's where it picks up. Portuguese at the bottom. Don't worry about it. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it here. Feel better now. Ooh. Well, 
Just one dose of the Holy Ghost is not enough for me. Just one dose of the Holy Ghost is not enough for me. Oh, just one dose of the Holy Ghost, not enough for me. Just one dose is not enough for me. Hey, just one dose of the Holy Ghost is not enough for me. Just one dose of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> bit everybody prime your pump <laughs> oh, I don't mean to snort I just can't help it oh, God. <laughs> Lord have mercy <laughs> oh Lord have mercy Thank you, Jesus. Come on, everybody. Ha, ha, ha. He, he, he. You can be seated for just a minute now. Let's keep drinking for a few minutes. Prime, Prime your own pump. The Holy Ghost is in you. Ready, amen. Just prime your own pump. Woo, glory. Drink a little bit. Ha, uh, ha, uh, uh. <laughs> Oh, Lord have mercy. Oh, my goodness. I'm so glad to see you guys. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. He, he, he. Hey. Ha, 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 ha. to drive her home tonight. <laughs> oh, mercy. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Ha, ha. Ha, ha. Mm. 
Man, I love all those different kinds of laughs. Oh, 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 oh Lord, have mercy. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh my goodness. Woo. Man, this joy is good for you. Oh, it gets all the junk off. You know what I mean? you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I know some people who, they want to jump in, they just need some help. I got my, <laughs> I got, I got my jump starters. You know how they have those, those church bulletins. I was raised as a Baptist and they make announcements in the bulletins. And sometimes they have misprints. Like one of them said, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Woo, ha, ha. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Woo, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> oh my goodness one of them said uh, the sermon tonight what is hell come early and listen to our choir practice <laughs> I like this one. And don't worry, Jesus. She's, he's, not, he's not offended at it because I asked him. Said the sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon this evening, searching for Jesus. Goodness gracious. Woo. Mary Hart does good like a medicine. I like this one. He said, uh, there'll be a bean supper in the fellowship hall following the service at 7 p.m. Music will follow. <laughs> That's terrible. I shouldn't have told that one. <laughs> Oh, mercy. <laughs> Here's one for the road. Said Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will be speaking tonight at Calvary Memorial Church. Come tonight and hear Bertha Belch all the way from Africa. <laughs> I can't even hardly talk. Now, you know, the Bible says in Job 5 and 22, isn't it 522? At destruction and at famine, thou shalt laugh. So if you've got anything pressing you tonight in the realm of destruction or 
Fam, you need to haul off and have yourself a good laugh. One, two, three, go ahead. <laughs> Did I tell you all that story? I know I did. My mother-in-law, she's lived with me for 24 years. My mother-in-law. And she's, she's what you call country come to town. She's from the deep south. Talking about this famine, you know, and, and laughing. So one time I, I was talking to her before she moved in with us. I was on the phone. We were newly married and we were having some, you know, financial issues and and so we're asking her for her prayer and agreement and help, you know, uh, in the spirit on that. And so we, you know, we, <laughs> she gave us some good counsel. And then she said, now, honey, I was waiting. Yes, ma'am. She said, just remember, they can't eat you. <laughs> and I said, what? She said, they can't eat you. They might can take the car and take the house, but they can't eat you. You'll live for another day. And I don't know why that blessed me. I just went around. They can't eat me. They can't eat me. <laughs> you might need to remember that when the bills come due. They can't eat you. Turn to your neighbor and say, they can't eat you. <laughs> ah, Lord have mercy. Oh, Lord have mercy. Well, everybody stand up. I'm going to sing you a song. Y'all, Actually, you can sing it with me. Crank it up, Brother CJ and Brother Craig. Woo! I've got joy. As soon as you get it, put it on there. Sunshine or stormy, you'll still hear me say, I got joy, I got joy, I've got joy, yes, I've got joy. With trouble all around me, I can sing amazing grace, I got joy, I got joy, I got joy, I got joy. Hey, problems cannot stop me, I'm gonna win this race, I got joy, I got joy, I got joy, I got joy. He's straight through my spirit, provider and friend. Shout it and say it again. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Yes, Listen to all. This joy is not dependent on what I feel or see. No matter what the struggle, I still have victory. This joy for my journey, no man can take away. The joy of the Lord is my strength today. Jesus is the solid rock I'm standing on today. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. He's taken all my burdens and washed my sins away. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. When I rise in the morning to see the day God has made, sunshine stormy, you'll still hear me say, I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Yes, I got joy. Hey, I got joy. I got joy. I got joy. Yes, I got joy. Oh, I got joy. I got joy. Does anybody in the house have some joy? Because it's my covenant right. Amen. I love you guys. You a blessing. When you go home tonight and you're in the shower, I hope you get one before you go to bed. Say ha ha ha. He, 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 hey. <laughs> Mr. Devil, get out of my way. Woo. When you're on the way to the church in the morning. Ha ha ha. He, 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 hey. Right? Amen. And we're going to have a good time in the morning, good word, good time of celebration. I love you.
I'm going to let you go. Just drink all the way out. Amen. All right. Pastors, anything? You're dismissed. Glory to God.